Oil. It's the stuff that powers our world. Without oil, we wouldn't have cars, airplanes, spaceships, or makeup. Oil is responsible for the technological society that we live in today. But we are using oil far faster than it can be replenished, and someday it will run out. Whether that will be in 50 years or 100 years, we know that it will run out. And even before it does, problems will begin to arise. When oil is burned, it releases greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. These gases trap heat inside our atmosphere and contribute to global warming. This causes the polar ice caps to melt, resulting in rising sea levels. Since 1870, the sea has risen over 7.7 inches, and the rate at which it is increasing is exponentially going up. The sooner we stop using oil, the better. But this is where the problem arises. Who in their right mind would ever stop using oil? It just doesn't make sense. The only way someone would stop using oil is if there was an alternative energy source that was cheaper than coal. As it turns out, there are quite a few options. To compare these energy sources, I'm using something called the Total System Levelized Cost. This is the minimum price that electricity must be sold for in order to break even with the expenses that a project will encounter over its lifetime. For reference, coal has a levelized cost of $95.6 per megawatt hour. The first alternative energy source on my list is biomass. Biomass reactors work by burning trees and plants to generate heat and spin a steam-powered turbine. Burning trees releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but if you replant those trees when you're done burning them, they will someday suck in the carbon dioxide that was released. Biomass has a levelized cost per megawatt hour of $102.6, a bit higher than coal. The problem is that even though the trees will eventually grow back, it takes about 100 years for the forest to completely recover. Biomass does not help reduce carbon dioxide emissions in the short term. Wind turbines are another alternative source of energy. Turbines built on land have a levelized cost of $80.3 per megawatt hour, cheaper than coal. But wind power has a disadvantage. It is a non-dispatchable power source. That's just a fancy term to describe the fact that you can't control how much wind you're going to get. Wind is unpractical for powering the whole world because you need to have a backup power source for when the wind doesn't blow. Hydroelectricity is one of the most reliable, renewable sources of energy. So long as the water is flowing, it's generating electricity. This energy source clocks in at $84.5 per megawatt hour, making it a bit more expensive than wind, but still cheaper than coal. Then, there is nuclear. There are two ways to generate electricity from nuclear, geothermal plants and nuclear reactors. Geothermal plants are built over geologically active sections of land. Nuclear decay heats up the ground, and this natural heat can be used to turn water into steam to spin turbines in the geothermal plant. There is a limited number of places where geothermal plants can be built, but building geothermal plants has great benefits. The levelized cost of geothermal electricity is $47.9 per megawatt hour, or exactly half the cost of conventional coal plants. Nuclear reactors are a more direct way to harness electricity from nuclear material. Fissile uranium and plutonium are split and release radiation, generating heat. This heat is used to vaporize water and spin a turbine. Nuclear power has a levelized cost of $96.1 per megawatt hour, slightly higher than coal but cheaper than biomass. That completes my list of oil competitive energy sources. There's many more renewable energy sources, but they're not competitive with oil and coal. Solar works by converting the sun's energy to electricity. This is the most expensive renewable energy source available and has a levelized cost of $130 per megawatt hour. Now that I've given you an introduction to the different renewable sources of energy, let's see a breakdown of the total electricity generation of each renewable power source. Hydroelectricity comprises more than half of emission-free electricity generation. Nuclear comprises slightly less of the pie chart than hydroelectricity. What is surprising is that wind makes up only 2.1% of the pie chart, geothermal only 1%, and solar energy a mere 0.1%. Hydroelectricity and nuclear must be doing something right in order to comprise so much of the total energy produced by renewables. As a matter of fact, they are. What these two energy sources have in common is their consistent outputs. They don't require backup energy. Both of them are also quite cheap. Hydroelectricity is more widely used because it's cheaper, but unfortunately, it can only be used on rivers and fast-moving water. 
On the other hand, nuclear reactors can be built anywhere. That's why I think nuclear reactors are the energy source of the future. Immediately, many of you will protest, but nuclear reactors aren't safe. It's true that there have been a lot of nuclear disasters, and lots of radiation has leaked into the environment, and millions of people have been displaced because of these disasters. But what about oil and coal? There have been lots of huge oil spills that have killed millions of animals and ruined thousands of miles of beaches. There have been thousands of people who have died of smog and pollution from coal plants. As it turns out, there are less nuclear-related deaths than oil-related deaths, and some scientists even say that using nuclear instead of oil has helped prevent approximately 1.8 million air pollution-related deaths. Still, nuclear reactors have some problems. They produce radioactive waste that lasts for thousands of years and must be put underground to prevent it from contaminating the environment. There is also a very small but real possibility of terrorists taking that nuclear waste and turning it into a nuclear bomb. There is an even bigger problem yet. If all the world switched over to nuclear power, within as little as 50 years we could run out of uranium. All these problems could be solved by a fancy new type of reactor, a liquid fluoride thorium reactor, or LFTR. LFTRs are a type of breeder reactor, meaning that they are much more efficient than today's reactors. First, thorium would be dissolved into molten salt and blasted by neutrons. This would cause the thorium to decay into uranium, a fissile material. That fissile material splits when hit by neutrons and releases a large amount of energy and several new neutrons as well. Those neutrons, in turn, cause more thorium to decay into uranium and the cycle continues. Before I continue, I must explain that there are two isotopes or kinds of uranium, uranium-238 and uranium-235. Today's reactors split uranium-235 to produce power. Uranium-238 absorbs neutrons instead of splitting immediately like uranium-235. But if uranium-238 gets hit by a neutron, after a few days it will have decayed into plutonium and will be ready to split and produce energy. Today's reactors don't have enough free neutrons flying around to transform uranium-238 into plutonium, so it ends up being exported as nuclear waste as it is replaced by new uranium-235. LFTRs would be able to transform uranium-238 into plutonium because they are breeder reactors. With LFTRs, almost all of the problems with modern reactors are solved. Because they are breeder reactors, they would transform fertile thorium into fissile uranium and produce much less radioactive waste. The waste that they would produce would only need to be stored for a maximum of 300 years instead of up to 15 million years. Because LFTRs use their fuel so much more efficiently, our supply of thorium could easily last us for upwards of 10,000 years. Now let's get into the realm of science fiction. Current reactors are fission reactors. They work by splitting heavy molecules apart. But there's another type of nuclear reactor that would be safer, better, and produce more energy than fission reactors. Fusion reactors. Instead of splitting heavy molecules apart, fusion reactors would fuse light molecules together. This produces a lot more energy, but it also requires a lot more energy. For fusion to work, particles have to be heated to extremely high temperatures and compressed to insane densities. Using high-power microwaves and extremely powerful magnets, some researchers are hoping to do just that. But so far, we can only create fusion for very short periods of time. If and when fusion reactors are invented, they will provide cheap energy for everyone. Fusion reactors could be easily turned on and off, wouldn't produce any nuclear waste, and would be completely eco-friendly, running on water. No longer will countries be fighting over oil, there will be electricity to spare. But until that day arrives, I think we should promote and use nuclear reactors to lower greenhouse gas emissions and provide cheap, clean energy for everyone. Thanks for watching!